is going on, everybody? You know what time it is again. It is another day, another episode of the Make Money and Have Fun show. My motto in life is make money and have fun. I'm on a mission to show everyone how to make money yeah, and have fun. I'm all about making money and having fun. All right, so for those of you that have been following along, all month this month is author month. So I'm talking to authors every single day. Yesterday, we had the privilege of sitting down with John Lee Dumas, the famous podcaster, as well as brand new author. But today, I have a really cool guest. So I've actually been kind of following this guy in secret. I don't know how much he knows it, but I'm talking to Steve Anderson today. And Steve Anderson wrote a really cool book called The Bezos Letters that he's going to tell you all about and he's also a speaker. He's probably also a coach, does all kinds of cool stuff. But let's hear it from him himself. So let's bring on to the stage Mr. Steve Anderson. What's up, Steve? Hey, Fred. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me. Of course. What's going on? You said you're over in, uh, in Tennessee. Tennessee, uh, snowy and cold <laughs> for us, you know. So, um, yeah, everything's shut down, which is partly fun and partly a pain, but yeah. that's okay. It sounds like 2020 all over again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I don't get it. I, I thought Nashville was supposed to be like warm and, and sunny all the time. So did I. So, uh, <laughs> we, you know, actually it's February here. And th if we get snow, it typically is around this time. So, okay. Yeah. Well, that's so, fair. so we shut down, you know, and actually the sun's out today and uh, it's supposed to be 50 this weekend. So it'll be all gone shortly. All right. Well, that's not too bad then. I think we're supposed to be going up to like 40, which compared to what we've had is like summer. Yeah, I <laughs> so get it. So I'm excited for that. I'm a, I'm a summer heat warmth kind of guy. I don't like the snow. I don't like the cold. And you, and you live in Philly, though. How does that work I, out? Yeah, I do. I was, I was born and raised <laughs> in Philadelphia. You know, Philly's not terrible because in Philly we get all four seasons. So it's I, like yep. you, you got an okay summer. You got an okay winter, although winter usually lasts too long in my opinion. <laughs> So it's it's not it's not terrible, but I'll be moving soon somewhere in the in the continental U.S. Not exactly sure where yet, but that's a different story for a different time. Yeah. Steve, tell us about yourself, man. What's your story? We want to hear it. Um, well, I uh, have spent my career in the insurance industry. Actually, early part of the career selling insurance with two insurance agencies, one in the Washington D.C. area where I grew up, and uh, the other in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And during that time, got uh, a real interest in technology, right? So database systems and the, when websites were coming and all of those kinds of things. And really trying to figure out, okay, how can insurance agents use that to more effectively work with uh, their clients? And so 25 years ago, I started my own firm doing really uh, research, speaking, writing, consulting around technology and emerging stuff that was coming and how the industry could use it. Well, fast forward to a couple of years ago, uh, probably now three or four, actually, um, I started asking the question because I saw technology developing so fast, is the biggest risk a business faces actually not taking enough risk? Meaning technology changes, you didn't have as a business owner the year or two years or three years timeline to figure things out. It was happening in months now, not years. And, you know, that start, that question started leading me to uh, do some research around companies, which you know, ultimately led to writing the book. Huh. That's, that's really interesting. I actually had no idea about that, that part of your story. So, yeah. so you, you took a different, a different look at risk in a sense, which is almost kind of like an investor's type yes. look. I come from, I come from an investor background. I started out in real estate investing. And for us, it's always how much debt can we get ourselves into? How much can we leverage? How much can we access? And those kinds of questions. And, and your kind of perspective on that is, is that's the way that businesses should be thinking as well. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, one of the concepts I explore in the book is uh, called return on risk. Uh, which is uh, what risks should you be taking versus the risk you should be avoiding. And again, very counterintuitive coming out of the insurance industry. And so that was, a, again, a different view or a lens that I took on, on that aspect of risk taking and business growth. 
uh, which again led me to Amazon, right? Looking for businesses right. that have been successful. It's uh, it's actually kind of hard to argue Amazon and Bezos haven't been successful. You may not exactly. like everything they've done, but my view has always been, you know, let's learn from the best. And are there things that um, that can help your own business? Of course, definitely. I, I think it's funny that that it came from an insurance background. Like, what, what would the other insurance agents think if you walked in and said, "Hey, I have an idea"? <laughs> well, at the at the beginning, I, people thought I was a little nuts, a little crazy, a little you know how can how can you think that way? Um, and again, the process of writing the book, uh, and again, the book is based on. The at the time, the 18 letters to shareholders that Jeff Bezos wrote starting in 1997 and, and actually now going through 2019 and the 2020 letter will typically is uh, released in April uh, of this year. So a couple of months, right. uh, I'll certainly be interested in his take on, you know, everything that's happened this last year. Interesting. So is there is there a direct correlation to the, the size of the company and the amount of risk that that company takes? That you uh, certainly for Amazon, it is. Okay. In fact, I, I call Jeff Bezos the master of risk uh, hmm. because a couple things. One is he views risk strategically. You said, you know, from your investment background, right? You, you look at risk. Yes, we have to take risk, but how much and what's our tolerance? Well, Bezos tolerance for risk is actually quite high because he made the connection between experimentation and innovation and really more specifically invention. And so he said many times in his letters that you've got to experiment in order to know what to invent. And by its very nature, an experiment means you're going to fail. And Amazon has failed a lot. Um, yeah. You know, there's some big ones, a lot of small ones. So he understood that experimentation and failure is a key part of business growth. And unfortunately, too many businesses, especially those that are successful, tend to minimize that. And, and actually, the, another phrase I talk about is the biggest risk a business faces is their success because they start protecting what got them there, not what's next or what do we, where do we need to explore next? And if Amazon does anything, it's always exploring something new. Interesting. So it's almost like, I feel like in, in individuals, um, I'm very, you know, steeped in personal development and that kind of stuff. And I feel like a lot of people kind of give themselves their own glass ceiling. And they, mm -hmm. they peak themselves. They, they've grown and grown and grown. And then they finally stop growing and their income kind of peaks and their, their lifestyle peaks. Would you say that, that that's definitely like a direct correlation from, from business to an individual in that regard? Yeah, I think definitely it is. In fact, mm -hmm. um, it makes me think of an article I read recently. And as you can tell, white hair, right? I'm, I'm let's say, on the older end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And uh, the article title was, you know, uh, never be too old to be a beginner. Uh, and that really resonated with me uh, in terms of, okay, everybody starts as, as a beginner at something new. So never think you can be too old not to be a beginner and mm. trying something new. Um, and, and in fact, right now, um, I'm I'm starting a whole new business, uh, co-founding with some other partners wow. and um, actually pretty excited about it. So again, my risk is right. Okay, it could fail. Absolutely. But sure. if I don't try, I, it I know it's never going to work. So for, for me, that's almost the fun part is yeah. like thinking like, man, what are the next six months going to be like when I take that lull in my finances, when my income drops a little bit, when I'm up late at night? And, you know, that's like that's part of the game in, in yeah. my in my opinion now is like I look at it as like, OK, what the heck is going to go wrong with this thing? But is it going to be worth it at the end? Yeah, exactly. And it's it's so funny. That, that you bring that up. I, I always, it, it's, it's interesting because I, I always kind of make this connection with all of my guests. Right now you're on the make money and have fun show. And the idea, at least in my mind and, and my belief system as I've kind of created it, is that people often, when, when things fail permanently, it's typically because they were out of alignment with the, the having fun side of, of the making mm. money. Yeah. I mean, I, I went through in the past, oh man, in the past like three months, I went through like six different businesses that started and stopped because I realized that they weren't really parallel to what I was doing and, and they weren't really 
they weren't really something that, that I loved or that, yeah. you know, my, my passion was behind it yep. at that point. So yep. I, I, I love this. Yeah, this is I amazing agree. stuff. So <laughs> let's talk, let's talk about, about your book. You have a really amazing book that, that just absolutely soared. I mean, I saw you had like a, a billboard in Tokyo or something, <laughs> something like that. Tell, tell us about kind of just the, the press and the media behind this book once it was released. Yeah. So, um, I, I think a couple things uh, about the book. One is um, I, I was able to take the shareholder letters and the way I describe it is Bezos laid out hidden in plain sight, his plan for growing Amazon. And I was able to distill kind of those, you know, actually ended up being almost 60,000 words, a whole book by itself uh, into mm-hmm. 14 principles and Uh, four cycles. So test, build, accelerate, and scale. And I believe those principles and those cycles can help any business uh, grow their business, whether they're a, you know, startup, whether they've been around for 15 or 20 years. And I always try and remind people that Jeff Bezos started as a startup. I mean, literally on his hands and knees, putting books in packages and driving them to the post office. Hmm. So, I don't think you're going to become the next Amazon. I think there were very unique factors at that time that sure. allowed that to happen. But I also think Jeff Bezos uh, may be recognized in the future as one of the most creative and uh, influential CEOs. And and again, lots of reasons for that. And some of the principles you know, tease out some of that. But even more importantly, it's not just for Amazon, but it really is, I think, for any type of business uh, that Hmm. can use these principles to figure out how they can grow to the point that they want to. Right. Yeah. Not everybody wants to or should be an Amazon, but that doesn't mean you can't be successful uh, in your your own business. Exactly. I, I think that it makes sense to definitely like look from the top down as kind of that that example. It's funny, though, because. I've never actually, I've never actually really studied Amazon or, or Jeff Bezos that much. And what what kind of brought up Amazon? I mean, you know, coming coming into this idea of an assessment of risk in insurance, you could have picked any business out there. What what made you pick Amazon and Bezos? Well, yeah, and I didn't at first. Um, hmm. I mean, I, at first I was looking at the businesses that actually failed, meaning Blockbuster, BlackBerry, Kodak you know, Sears and, and okay, why, why did they not make those transitions? Well, and again, I think a lot of it was how they approached technology or how they certainly in Blackberry's case, how, when the iPhone was announced, they were like, nobody wants a glass. Huh. Am I frozen? Is he frozen? Let me see. Timer's still going off. That's interesting. All right. I don't know what is going on here. I have a frozen Steve Anderson on my screen. Let me read. Right. So this is interesting. I think that because of all the snow that we have out there, my internet is being extra annoying today. So it looks like right now, it looks like I lost Steve. I don't know where Steve went. I don't know what what happened over here, but the snow likes to interrupt what we have going on. But so many great lessons out of this, I think, an assessment on risk. And, And it's funny because if we look at risk, even right now, we're, we're taking a risk, right? We're taking a risk by putting our, basically our Wi-Fi up in the snow. We're putting everything out there that we have. And even doing this show is just a risk all the time. It's a risk of knowing whether or not my guest is going to show up, what's going to happen, this, that, or the third. And, right, we got to improvise sometimes because sometimes things just don't like to cooperate with what you got going on. But let's talk about this real quick. So this is so interesting to me. So Steve writes this book called The Bezos Letters, and he's talking all about Amazon and Amazon's assessment of risk and how Amazon likes to take on more risk 
because of the size of the company. I recently did a show. I guess it wasn't super recently. It was it was last summer. But I did a show once called How Risky Is Debt was the name of the show. And it was, it was really fun for me to go through this because, again, I was coming from an investor mentality and an investor mindset where I never looked at debt as risky because I started off as an investor and I learned how to utilize debt, how debt becomes a tool, how there's such things as good debt and bad debt, and just how debt can be used to help you leverage your life, help you make more money, help you grow, help you scale, help you get to a bigger level, help you increase your business, and kind of just go from there. And so I looked at it and I said, you know, if I'm using all of this debt and I spend $30,000 in debt and I do a project that makes me forty dollars or $50,000, that was worthwhile money to spend because debt is accessible money or it's access to money at that point. And we can always access money or typically we can access money faster than we can make it. Right? Even if you're making $10,000 a month working at a job, you can go, go and get a credit card for $10,000 in two minutes, fill out the application in a minute, two minutes, and you got a credit card for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars at that point, and you now have access to, you know, that's half a year's salary at that point. If you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year and they give you a fifty thousand dollar credit card, that's half a year's salary right there. And you get a couple of those, you get three, four, five credit cards, all of a sudden you got a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of available credit, and this is money that you can access and that you can use. So I love what Steve is bringing up here. I love what Steve is talking about. Unfortunately, like like I said, we can't seem to find him for some reason right now. Um, So either the snow doesn't like to cooperate with us, or I don't know what is going on. Uh, Oh, so Steve just sent me an email and said his power just went out, so he'll be back as soon as he can. Right, so it is the snow that likes to likes to kind of mess with us and make us struggle. And yeah, but I mean, this is this is the fun of it. This is the cool part about risk is that you don't know what's going to happen. You wake up every morning and you have no idea what's going to happen, how it's going to work, what's going to go on. And today, you know, we're just going through these other snags, these other bumps. What really matters, though, I think in any situation involving risk or involving any kind of uncertainty is what you do up here, how your mind works, what your mind says to you, because it can be scary. It can be fearful, right? It could be something that we're afraid of, but in reality, it all just comes down to how we interpret it and how we stand with it in that point. I mean, you can look at it, you can freak out, you can worry. Oh no, I put a lot of money up. I risked a lot. There's a lot at stake here because of this. If it doesn't go right, then I lose X, Y, and Z. But if it does go right, the upside is so big. And I think really the the, the whole point of it all is just to maintain your composure, to go through it with a level head, with a level of sanity, and, and just enjoy it along the way. That's why it's make money and have fun. It's not make money or have fun. It's not have fun and forget about the money. It's make money and have fun because it's all about that level of sanity going through it. Now, watch this. Check it out. We have Steven Anderson back in building, everybody. Steve, I don't know what I just talked about for like the last five minutes, but I think it was like it was like you were here the whole time. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, my no power worries. is out. <laughs> wow. Interesting. The, the snow really doesn't want us to have a good conversation oh, today. Man, you know, I'm trying. Is this okay? You know, this, quality wise, and I like this. You you look good. What are you on your phone or something? Uh, iPad. Oh, Actually, nice. My wife's iPad. So there you go. Look at that. See, that's why the world gave us iPads. You know what? Let me um, bear with me a second, if I can. Yeah. Let me um, let me get a headset so the sounds a little better. Cool. I'll be here. All right, so we were talking about risk as it relates to making money and having fun. See, here's the interesting thing. Whenever you do anything big, whenever you do anything that's that's monumental, right, whether it's starting a business, becoming an investor, whatever it might be, there's going to be risk associated with it. Crap, I mean, look, even getting married has risk associated with it. Even 
buying a car, buying a house, having children, whatever it might be, there's all this risk associated with it. But I think what it really comes down to at the end of the day is how we tolerate and deal with that risk as we go through it. Vicki Helm is here. She said that I am great. I don't know if she's talking about me or about Steve or about both of us, but I'm just winging it here. I'm just having a great time. Thanks for being here, Vicki. Thanks for hanging out with us. I think Steve might be back here. He might be ready to go. He's giving me the thumbs up. All right, Steve, give us some golden nuggets here, man. We've been we've been missing you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, no worries. Like I said, power out and trying to figure out, you know, adapting on the fly. And that right? part this of the is... – uh, I'm trying to get that camera angle right too. So uh, This is going to be, be the next chapter in your book about the assessment <laughs> of risk when, when the power goes out. When the power goes out, what do you do? Go back to cellular. Hopefully that Exactly, works, so. exactly. So, so Steve, um, you, you were telling us good stuff. I forget what it was, but it sounded I, good. I'm trying to think. So let me – let me at least where I think – and I, I, actually you asked me a question about kind of uh, book success and, uh, you know, what that has looked like. Um, so – yeah, the book took off. Um, it, it certainly um, helps having um, uh, Amazon and Bezos on the cover. But really, I think more important than that is is people really are curious about, you know, what is it that Bezos has done and how has Amazon grown? So actually, right now, there are uh, the book is being translated into 18 languages. Uh, the, the last one we got uh, literally this last week was Albania. Um, wow. which if you don't know where it is, I actually had to look it up. It's uh, on the Adriatic Sea, just kind of north of uh, Greece there. But uh, uh, Korea and Russia and, and uh, lot, lots of different countries have, uh, have purchased the, the rights to, um, uh, to, to publish the book. So that's, that's been exciting um, and, and surprising, I think. But again, I think it goes back to certainly people understand the success there and I really tried to delve into, okay, what, what are some of the key areas there that um, Bezos was, was able to do? So, um, and as I said, 14 principles, four cycles. And, you know, uh, I, we could talk about a couple. We talked a little bit about risk. And, and let me give you principle number one, which is encourage successful failure. Um, and often you hmm. don't hear those words success and failure in the same phrase. And so, you know, part of what I looked at with Amazon is the culture at Amazon really is to experiment. And again, I think I said before, experimentation absolutely has to leave, lead to failure because if you know it's going to work, it's not an experiment. Um, and, and so that's a core concept. Uh, at, at Amazon. In fact, Amazon uh, has lots of failures. I briefly describe, you know, one, maybe I, maybe their biggest, uh, but certainly, you know, one of them at least is in uh, 2014, Jeff Bezos got on stage and announced the Fire Phone. Uh, now, think about this. 2007, the iPhone came out. 2014, Bezos decided it was a good idea to have an Amazon phone. Why? Well, we already had the iPhone, we already had Android, but the Amazon phone was designed to make shopping on Amazon faster, easier, and quicker. Um, okay, so maybe they thought that was a good idea, but nobody else did. I don't need another phone. And so at, at the end of 2014, they actually dropped the price down to um, 99 cents and, and literally couldn't give away the phone. And so... Um, at the end, fourth quarter of that year, they wrote off $178 million in development costs and inventory costs for that phone. Big failure, huge expense. And what's the success out of that? Hmm. Four months after that phone was announced, um, Bezos got his first demo of a new device that they were creating that would sit on a desk or on a counter in a kitchen that you could talk to and ask questions and it would respond to you. Well, certainly what we now know as Echo, the hardware device, right. and Alexa, right, the machine learning software that recognizes what you're asking and looks up and provides information. But all of that help they did um, 
in, in terms of understanding voice processing, right, all of that kind of stuff, they were able to transfer into the Echo device. And, and now I think we can pretty much say the Echo uh, ecosystem, because that really is what it's become, is a, one of the more successful uh, products uh, that Amazon has uh, created. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's so interesting. I, I'm always more fascinated with the, the story of the downfall of someone who's, who's a major player now than I am of like how they actually got there. Right. A lot yeah. of people look at like, for instance, this year, like Elon Musk, they're like, Oh my God, he, he went from, you know, whatever the, the 50th richest person to the first richest person in one year. How the heck did he do it? And I, I'm more fascinated to hear the story about when Elon Musk couldn't lend you a dollar because he was so broke and, and so, you know, underwater that it looked like he would never amount to anything. Right. Which I, I find so cool with, with this this idea of encourage successful failure. Because I've been thinking recently, and, and you might have an opinion on this, I'm curious if there is a way to really reach high levels of success without ever going down first. I, I, I actually... I think it would be unusual. I'll say it that way. Yeah. Not impossible, but I... I, I you know, again, you hear this, I think, a bit, but you often learn more from what didn't work, you know, than what did. Uh, and without that crucible of, oh, I tried this, it didn't work. And I, at Amazon, they really have institutionalized that process. Hmm. Um, a quick story. In 2004, Jeff Bezos sent an email out to their senior leadership team and said that no longer will anyone be allowed to use a slide-oriented presentation, PowerPoint, Keynote, at a meeting where we are making a decision. Hmm. And, and he required them to write what's now called a six-page narrative or a six-page memo, or more recently called working backward documents, that he thinks, and again, one of those quirks of Bezos that absolutely is brilliant, that when you are forced to write out your idea and the first step in that process is to write a press release for when the product service platform that you're proposing is released to the public. So you're hmm. thinking into the future, what are the key elements? And then you start looking at what do we have to do to deliver that benefit and those key elements? And the benefit of that, one is it, it, it slows down decision making to speed it up, right? You get all, you get more, not all, but you get more of the questions out on the table early on so you know what the problems are and what you have to solve for. And if something doesn't work like the Fire Phone, now you have a document you can go back to after the fact and go, okay, what assumptions did we make that were incorrect? And what do we learn from that that we can carry forward? So I, I actually think that six page narrative is one of those key um, uh, success secrets, I guess I would call hmm. it at Amazon. Interesting. That's so Man, this is so fascinating. We, I could talk about this all day long. I'm, I'm a, I'm a geek when it comes to entrepreneurship, personal development, and growth. I could, we could talk about this all day long. But we got to remember, this is still author month. So let's talk a little bit about authoring, about book writing. I always, okay. I always I'd be like, happy to. There you go. I always like to address the person, uh, the the viewers who are watching that are in that place where they want to write a book, but they never have. You know, something is is holding them back. What kind of advice would you give to somebody who's who's in that place that wants to write a book but just doesn't know how to start? Um, actually, the advice is pretty simple, and it, it is what I used. Uh, and I, let me make the distinction. So kind of in my career, I've written thousands of articles, typically 1,000 to 1,500 words each. Writing a book is a very different process because now you have to write, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 of those articles in a cohesive narrative that draws the reader through the book. So there's a lot of strategy actually mm -hmm. around what makes a good book. Yeah. My advice, literally write 500 words a day, every day, 
hmm. every week. I, for me, it's every weekday. Uh, right. I still do that now. Um, and it's called, you know, put down whatever you're thinking, put it down in writing. And you may or may not have a book at that point, but you at least have captured your idea, hopefully your passion. And one of the things that I use all the time in order to do that is I actually dictate. Yep. Because, you know, when people write, especially if you're not used to writing, you tend to get um, too professional, too, uh, it, it, your, your writing can get, um, what's the, I'm searching for the right word I want to use, um, boring. <laughs> right, like, like methodical kind of. Methodical, you use words you wouldn't normally use when you're talking, but if you dictate using you know, lots of different apps and ways to do that. An easy way literally is to record yourself and then transcribe it um, right. and then edit, right? So I do that a lot. Mm. But if you bit by bit by bit, you will get those thoughts down. Now, it still may not be a book yet, right. but at least you've got the framework that sure. then you can work on. Okay, what are the what are the stories that I need to write about to illustrate the points I'm trying to make. And that, that for me was, you know, key in terms of the book that um, I put together mm -hmm. was not just the principles, but okay, what's, what's the stories. And I did a lot of research and write talking and listening to interviews with Bezos and, and pulled out some of those things and then made that connection between the principle and, and here's how Bezos applied it or Amazon applied it as they move forward. And then maybe most importantly, here's how you can apply it in your business. Right, right. I, I think it's so cool that, that you kind of went down that path because I've written three books at this point. And my first book was was kind of the, the first thing that, that you talked about, which is just sitting down and writing. Right. And literally, like I typed out every word in this book. So I wrote The Revolutionary Mindset. It was my first book. Yep. And it was kind of just one of those projects to prove to myself that I could write a book. I was 21 years old at the time. And I'm like, you know what? I think I can do it. A friend of mine wrote a book and I, I'm, I'm too competitive. How to... hard can that be? Right? Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, if he can write it, he's not going to be the only one. I'm going to write one, too. And you're going to love this, Steve. So so the day after I, I pushed publish, I just did a self-publish on, on KDP with this book. Yep. And the day after I pushed publish, well, the day of. I vowed to myself, I said, I'm never writing a book again because this was such an arduous, tedious, annoying, drawn out process. And and like you said, you really get caught in the weeds of the words when you're when you're kind of typing it out. You're just like you're making it very eloquent and very neat and proper. Well, you're, at, you're trying to add it as you go, which actually yeah. is not the right process. Mm -hmm. right? You need to get the thoughts down and, and leave editing till later. Exactly. Because like you said, there's there's two points to it. The one is getting the words on the page and the other one is allowing the reader to to go on a journey basically yes. throughout this book, which is, I think, what's really lacking in my first book. So the day after I published it, when I woke up, the only thing I wanted to do was write. <laughs> I was like, what's going on? And so I discovered blogging where I'm like, wait a minute. I can write 500 to, to 1500 words, get my point out there and share it in 10 to 15 minutes this is awesome. Yep. So I did that for about four years and I put all my blogs together in my second book, yep. which was just a real easy project to, you know, to throw that together. But then my third book, I actually did it a different way where I actually hired a ghostwriter. And it was mm -hmm. cool because the ghostwriter focused on typing the words on the page. And I focused on that story like you were talking about. And I said, where's the reader at? Where do they need to go? Where are we trying to get them? You know, and, and what do they need right now? So, so it was kind of that neat perspective of having two sets of eyes on it, which you kind of did by, by dictating it, you know, you were able to step back and look at it and go, all right, mm -hmm. I got, I basically did, I call that like a mind dump where right. you like mind dump all the words onto the page. And then you step back and you're like, all right, now where does this need to go? How does this need to flow? And that kind of stuff. Uh, so, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and for me, it, um, I, I do read, I, I think lots of people can or should write books um, but I think mindset going in, if you're writing a book kind of as your big business card, um, it might do more damage than, than benefit. Um, and, and I've actually read a few books of kind of entrepreneurs, online marketers, you know, that, that wrote a book. Um, right. And unfortunately, it actually lowered my opinion of them hmm. because they, it was basically a long sales letter. Right. Right. To buy my product or, or go in my coaching or go as opposed to 
giving everything they've got in the book, understanding that there are going to be people who want more, right? Even if you yeah. lay out all the steps uh, to do. Um, and, and as you said, it's easy today, KDP, you know, all kinds of different ways to get a book published. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's going to be a good book or going right. to serve your purposes ultimately. Yeah. So so let's talk about publishing since you kind of brought that up. And I, and I totally agree with you, by the way. I, I've seen so many people that, that use their book as a business card. Like for my first book, I've given away more copies of that book yep. than, than I've sold. I mean, I, I'm, I would be shocked if you told me I made a hundred bucks off of that book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's it, it was part of the learning process for me. And, and for me, it was it was mostly a project for myself than anything else. My third book that's coming out is, is like you said, to to serve the people. It's with a publisher and that kind of stuff. So your your book, like like we mentioned before, has had quite a bit of success. It's a Wall Street Journal bestseller. It has foreign rights. It's written in over over a dozen languages, all that kind of stuff. What do you think really kind of makes that difference in, in terms of publishing between like a self-published versus where you're at with the Bezos letters? Okay. Um, yeah, and, and I, I have a bit of an inside track is actually my wife, who's actually mm. and the, the co-author of the book uh, mm. and the one responsible for making it readable. I'll be given her full credit um, <laughs> actually is has been in the book publishing industry for many years. And really, wow. kind of there are three models out there today. First model is traditional publishing, you know, New York House. You go to them with a book proposal. Uh, they may or may not accept it. They may or may not give you an advance, and that advance may or may not be big or small. Um, the, the, the issue there is that um, it's really hard to get a book deal with a traditional publisher today. Um, they're very selective. They, um, and, and the other kind of technical part is when you sign that publishing contract, you give over your intellectual property rights to them. On the on the other end is a full self publishing, but you know that absolutely could be a viable model. But you also have to learn to become a publisher, book right. cover, internal design, and all those things seem oh easy. You know, I could use a layout program, and there's all kinds of uh, you have to learn all kinds of things to do it well. I, again, I pick up books that. The internal design, how how the pages are structured, makes it hard to read the book, right? Which makes it hard for the person buying the book to continue. So absolutely a good option. And you, you keep all your intellectual property rights and you have to do all the book, you know, stuff. And it's unlikely self-publishing, you'll be able to get into bookstores, right? Now, again, you could argue, does it do I care? Is my topic going to be something that's going to have, you know, more general uh, appeal that being in a bookstore is going to be really helpful? And then the middle is a hybrid publisher, which kind of takes the best of, of traditional and the best of self-publishing. And that's actually my publisher, Morgan James, is a is known for a hybrid publisher. I maintained all my intellectual property rights. So any okay. other products, courses, coaching I do fully mine, no questions asked. Um, they handled the design, uh, edit, final editing, <clears throat> um, and distribution, you know, so they actually have a sales force of people who go to bookstores, probably now call them up and pitch different books that, um, are being published. And why I have foreign rights is they have a foreign rights editor whose job it is to pitch books to other publishers in other countries. And, um, you know, so I, I self-publishing wouldn't have had the advantage of those foreign rights and, and translation rights and, and all of those kinds of things. So, again, different models and right. what's appropriate for what your goal is for your book will depend on, you know, and budget, frankly. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, ghostwriting is is can be expensive <laughs> I, <laughs> to get somebody good. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I always all joke of those factors uh, go into you know, which is the best option for an individual right. author. 
I, I always joke with people about the ghostwriters. I, uh, I spent a day where I think I had four calls with four different ghostwriters and I was quoted anywhere between like $17,000 to $45,000. And I'm yep. like, okay, <laughs> yeah. let me, let me reassess this a little bit and figure out, you know, cause you know, again, thinking in, in, as an investor, it's like, how do I leverage this? How do I arbitrage it? How do I make it make sense right. at that right. point? Yep. Absolutely. And again, right. I think what's, what's the purpose of the book? If, you know, again, if it's, uh, platform building and, and some of those kinds of things, you know, you might not need a high level, but if it's, if it's more, and again, for, you know, one of my goals for my book was uh, keynote speaking, right? Those kinds of things. So having a good book and, you know, we have over 300 reviews on Amazon with a mm. 4.6 average. Um, and, and, and actually one of those one star reviews was that, um, I run an Italian ice, you know, store. I don't know how this would apply to me. <laughs> so I don't know what to do about those. But, you know, again, you want some of those one star <laughs> reviews because it, it means that different people are reading the book and, you know, mm -hmm. all of those kinds of things. So, yeah, it makes it look legit at that point. Yeah, it's exactly. not just like, oh, you, you got, you know, you have 300 relatives that, that gave you five stars. Good for you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, exactly. We, I, I worked for a company prior to this and, and we had we, we kept bragging that we had all five star reviews. And we're like, man, we can't wait to get the first four star review in here to make this look more legitimate. <laughs> look, look, yeah, exactly. Look legit. So so we actually were pretty excited when we got the one star. OK, now now we're now we got that. We're OK. Let's just make sure we don't get too many. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always like that when uh, when I have a hater, someone who, who like yells at me in the comments. I'm like, yes, I made yeah. a good video. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, and I, we did have another one star now that I think about it that was uh Somebody was mad, or, you know, early uh, last year in the pandemic when uh, Amazon was late getting their package to their house. So, uh, therefore, my book was bad. So. <laughs> oh, you gotta love that. Uh, what can you actually? You laugh and you go, okay, you know. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure in, in insurance you, you developed a really thick skin, like like I did as an investor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. People, people are mad that you're that you're trying to buy their house. Yeah, like, exactly. You know, I, I, do you have anything better to do today than, than yell at me anyway? <laughs> <laughs> so it seems like really the, the kind of the two tips to kind of come down to, I guess, three. One would be would be check your budget for everything that you're trying to do. Number two is is what's the plan with the book? You know, again, you know, going back to what Stephen Covey taught us in the seven habits, which is begin with the end in mind. And then number three is is kind of just just recognizing how many options there are out there. I think that right. that's. That's what sticks up a lot of people who. Have well, and let me book. let me give you another one, Fred. That yeah. um, again, my wife says over and over again when she's talking to authors about publishing their work, it and she says over and over again, authors don't make money on their book; they make money on what the book makes possible. Mm. And so, having that end in mind is really key. It's not just oh, great, I'm a published author, but. I'm a published author and I have this course and I yeah. have this coaching and I have this, right. What, what's, what's it leading to? What, what do you want to really ultimately accomplish, you know, with, with that book? Yes. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, that was the biggest thing. I became good friends with, with David Hancock last year, who I'm sure you know very oh, well. I was going to say, <laughs> Oh yeah. Okay. And, uh, and that was, we, we've had multiple conversations about that, that, you know, this idea that authors don't make money off of books. They make mo money off of, like you said, you know, keynote speeches or coaching programs or masterminds or courses, whatever, whatever you want your back end thing to, to kind of be. And it was, it was interesting for me because in 2020, I was transitioning from investing into speaking and then COVID came around and they're like, oh, you're going to have to work a little bit harder than, than you normally would have. Yeah. <laughs> And so, you know, you're absolutely right with that. I think keeping that in mind is is a huge, huge point for anybody who's an aspiring author. Yep. And, and just for anybody, you know, watching, David Hancock is the founder of Morgan James Publishing. So exactly, uh, great guy. You know, great company, great publisher. I've been, you know, very, very pleased. Eh, he's an okay guy. He's an okay guy. <laughs> he's all right. I, I always joke with him. I uh, I had the call with uh, with him and Jim. And uh -huh. I, I told I told Jim, I'm like, I met him in, in person in the beginning of 2021. And he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. What was that like? And I'm like, I've, I've been trying to repress it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he's an awesome dude. I actually had him on my show about two, three months ago. Cool. Some, 
like that. Great. So he's a he's a great guy. Great guy. Great story. Great visionary. You know, just and and again, all out of his publishing experience that he said, mm-hmm. "There's got to be a better way to do this." So absolutely, yeah. He's he's the person to know. Absolutely, yeah. Steve. This has been awesome, man. So how can people get in touch with you? How can they contact with you or? Just sure. Say so uh, a couple ways. One is the book website is thebezosletters.com. Um, and lots of information there. Um, in addition to uh, some workbook, and if you do buy the book, uh, some additional help for you to, to apply the book to your own uh, situation, your own business. And, and frankly, I've had nonprofits say, boy, these principles apply to us also. So it's it's more than just business, uh, which is sort of exciting to see how that has expanded out. Now, so thebezosletters.com. And um, I'm also uh, really active on LinkedIn. Uh, and so I do a lot of writing and articles there. Uh, so you can find me there. Steve Anderson uh, probably will pull it up, but Steve Anderson Insurance uh, also there. So connect, let me know you uh, saw me here and uh, I'll be glad to connect with you. This is awesome stuff, man. I love this. Steve, I'm so thankful, so glad that, that you were able to be here, that we were able to hang out. Well, thanks, Fred. I'm day. so sorry for some of the technical stuff. I don't even think the power's on yet. Again, so, <laughs> no worries. Uh, I- I've been having so much weird stuff with uh, with the snow. So I, I just I took my car and I had to get it repaired. And I had no service anywhere on my phone. I'm like, why can't I connect to anything? And it's probably right. because this dang snow is just coming down. I'm moving to Florida next year and I'll forget about all this. <laughs> there you go. You said you're moving someplace. Some, someplace warmer might sound like a good idea. So I, I don't know where I'm going to end up going. Um, it's based on my my girlfriend's job. So I'm just hoping I'm hoping it's not, you know, Wisconsin or Minnesota <laughs> or South Dakota. You well, know, those are Maine. great places in the summer. So, uh, yeah, but, eh. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm leaning towards Arizona. You know, Miami would be nice. Yeah. California, those kinds of places is is kind of where I'm leaning towards. Yeah. So, Steve, what's what's next for you? What's the next big thing in, uh, in Steve Anderson's life? Well, um, I have. Um, Actually, um, very beginning idea of a uh, second edition of the Bezos letter. So certainly with mm. uh, the announcement of what now a couple of weeks ago of uh, Bezos stepping down as CEO and moving into a executive chairman position, mm. um, I suspect, I don't know, we'll see, but the 2021 letter, I'm not sure if Bezos will write it or Andy Jassy, the new Amazon CEO, will write it. So that might be the end of an era and uh, a second edition, you know, to kind of encapsulate all the letters that that he was responsible for for putting yeah. together and updating some information and, you know, uh, COVID, how Amazon responded and some of those kinds of things. So that's um I, I say in the works, it's probably conceptual right now and trying to figure out, OK, what would a second edition look like? And, right. you know, do we wait a little longer uh, to kind of see how those letters actually end up? Interesting. So, and and then I've uh, actually um, I, I believe so much in that six page narrative. I've actually created a course uh, teaching uh, really businesses. OK, what is this thing? And. You know, what are the nuances of it and how can you apply it you know, this uh, into your own business? And and I think I mentioned I'm starting a new company yep. and I actually used that six page narrative to pitch the idea to investors uh, and actually ended up with seven investors um, who are investing quite a bit of money you know, into the entity. But I do think the process of one creating it and presenting it and using it as the framework you know, really helped with with that and streamlined that process. Nice. That's awesome. I love it. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about that second edition already. <laughs> I, I found out, so here's something really interesting. I, I learned the other day that Jeff Bezos only owned 12% of Amazon. Yeah. I was like, what? He's still the largest shareholder. The single yeah. shareholder, but... <laughs> That that's insane. I'm like, I, I didn't even, I didn't even really conceptualize that until after the person said it. I'm like, wow, yeah. he only owns 12% of Amazon. He's the richest person on planet earth. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Well, and, and again, I'll, I'll, I mean, part of the, you know, the, the richest person on earth was his long-term thinking. So 
I mean, he said in that original 1997 letter, so that they Amazon went public in May of 1997. That first letter came out in April of 1998. And one of the things he said there uh, in that letter was, we, I will run Amazon based on long-term trends, not short-term Wall Street expectations. And if you look at their stock price or look at their profitability, those first probably 10, 12 years, they didn't make money. Yeah. But they reinvested everything into infrastructure, fulfillment, logistics, experimentation to sure. build. And, and now you see that hockey stick, right, by having that long term thinking and be willing to invest early and often into infrastructure. Now they're seeing those returns that are skyrocketing. So okay. there's a reason. Right. It's not just, oh, he was lucky. There's a reason why that has happened. Amazing. Amazing. I love that. I think it is too. You know, I, yeah. you know, a lot of people look at Steve Jobs, you know, amazing uh, and, and maybe some others, but I think Bezos, you know, kind of as he transitions into a different, you know, uh, uh, what's the right word position, I guess, or, or where he spends his time, I think we will see some of the recognition of uh, some of these things that he's done. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that that's, that really hockey stick is, is a curve that I think is a pattern in a lot yeah. of businesses. Yeah. This, this has been so cool. I, I love talking about this stuff. I'm geeking out over this. I, I'm going to go buy 10 copies of the Bezos letter and give them out to my friends and all kinds of stuff. And everybody out there, if you haven't got your copy yet, make sure you go get it. Check out the Bezos letters. Dot yep. com. And and, and just so here, well, let me, uh, so oh, there it is. the right angle. So that's the book cover. Uh, people always ask me, uh, is that Jeff Bezos? And no, it's not. It's an Adobe stock photo. But it goes to show you again the, the importance of book cover design because the whole, the only purpose for a book cover is to get somebody to pick it off the shelf or click on it on Amazon, right, for, for more information. And, mm -hmm. and a fun little I, you know, fact, I guess. So it's dark all around. And, and we, you really want to stay away from a white cover because on Amazon, what's their background? White. It's white. And so uh, the book gets lost. The book cover gets lost on that, on that book page when you're, you know, looking for books. So, you know, mm -hmm. those are the, a lot of the little things that um, you may not think about, but really are important in order to help your book. Yeah. Out. That's smart. I actually didn't even think of that until you just said it. <laughs> I had not either. Right. Yeah. Now, now I got to throw out all my white book cover. <laughs> Steve, well, this has been amazing, man. Thank you so much for being here. This has been such a fun chat. Definitely one of my, one of my favorite interviews so far. I'm going to go check out your book. Everybody else out there should go buy a copy or multiple copies of this book. Cause it sounds absolutely awesome. And go hang out with Steve on LinkedIn. He's waiting for you over there. That'd be great. On that and note, remember, if you do get the book, go to the thebezosletters.com uh, workbook and a couple mm -hmm. other things there to uh, help you really apply those lessons to your own situation. Exactly. Thebezosletters.com. It's right there in the in the little description. And also hang out with Steve on LinkedIn. Steve, what would you like to leave our guests with today? Words of wisdom. Words of wisdom. Um, or anything, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me... I, 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 I'll take a, a minute or two if I can. I have enough time. Yeah. Um, principle 14 in my book is called Believe It's Always Day One. And this is a core concept of Bezos. And he actually talked about it in that first 97 letter where he said, you know, this is early days for the Internet. It's, it's day one for the Internet, right? It's just starting. And for Amazon, if we execute well. Well, Every letter since, he ends at the letter with some form of, um, you know, and, and actually in the last year, uh, 2019 letter, he said, even with all of the problems we've been facing in, in 2019, and, tw and I, I say 19, in 2020, you know, it, it's still day one. And again, that idea of what was it like that first day you opened and started your business? When you walk through that door, are you still thinking it's day one? In fact, his office 
building in Seattle where he has ha, has had will have his office um, is called the day one building again that Amazon still thinks of themselves hmm. as a startup which is sort of crazy right when you think about 1.3 million employees they added last year 470,000 employees but they still think of themselves as a startup Wow. Again, that mindset, that core culture that's built into there. So, you know, when you wake up in the morning and uh, go into your your office, whatever that looks like, or start working, you know, think about it being day one and the excitement that you can bring to your clients. And I'll end with this. One of the my favorite phrases that Bezos uses is, we invent on behalf of the customer. So what are you doing to invent a better experience, a new product, a new service, a new platform on behalf of your customer, even when they don't know they want it. Yeah, that's amazing. I love that so much. Be- begin, you know, begin every day as if it were day one. Yep. It's is so huge. I think the common thread throughout all of this is just to keep on growing no matter how big you get. I love that. Steve, this has been awesome, man. Thank you so much for being here. My Definitely pleasure. Gonna, Thanks for having me. Do the second one of this when, when the uh, when the second edition comes out. All right, I'll let so you know. Fun. Awesome, sounds good. See you, Steve. Stay okay. stay warm. Thanks, Red. Yep. See you.